Hi, this is Daryl Webster from Adopt and Embrace, and I'm here with Mark Cashman. Um, Mark, uh, whereabouts do you work in Microsoft? Uh, well, when the sun is out, I work outside, so I can work anywhere. Oh, but beautiful. But generally speaking, I'm on the SharePoint team, and I also look at OneDrive and SharePoint, what we do in the inner loop. And technically, our building right now is over in Bellevue, but soon we'll be moving back to campus. If you know the, the campus space, we're going to be moving to Building 3. We came from Building 1. Uh, oh, right. But always Microsoft Redmond campus. Yeah. Now, many of you that are viewing this have probably never, well, I almost guarantee it, haven't been to Microsoft campus. <laughs> so, and this is what it's we're trying to do. Just a little bit far from just a little New bit, Zealand yeah, and, New Zealand and, and Australia. Where other customers are. Yeah, and we're, we're trying to also bring to you a bit of the surroundings as we talk about uh, in a loop, out a loop collaboration around documents because that's Mark's specialty. And we'll, we'll be talking through a few things uh, around that to try and help you understand how it works, and then how we might be able to help you onboard your people to, to start working this way in a relevant sense. So first, I think the, the view is this is the inner loop. This is me working with Daryl today. Yeah. But then this is the outer loop. Hey, Mark. So I'm going to be doing some things and I'll be broadcasting yeah. over here. And, and, I, and I pass. another team and I'm on the outer loop over here. I pass you while, <laughs> while you're walking by, right? Absolutely. Because our inner loop, you'll be working beside me or even, you know, on constant contact. But our outer loop is much like this. I'm passing you in the hallway. Hey, haven't seen you for a while. Yeah. What do you think? Oh, let me share the campaign I was just working on. We yeah. just finished it. I just published it. Yeah. I actually think it's going to be more of like a Venn diagram. Okay. And our loops are going to overlap yes. almost every day always yeah but depending on what we're doing and how finished things are and who we're working with is really what changes the the how i work and, mm. and what i'm working on mm. now that, that's a, a, a <clears throat> good place to start actually sure you've got a, a way of thinking about um me we us kind of work yeah so we don't want to always position you know use this tool to do this exact thing because you're going to come across people that work a little bit differently and you're going to be at different stages of a project or you might be in the late phases where you're actually ready to broadcast it out to the whole company mm -hmm. but the concept of me we us is just trying to understand how do people work and we have built tools to support the different phases of a life cycle of a project uh, maybe even a proposal mm -hmm. or a very large campaign whatever that might be so if you think of the me space is OneDrive mm -hmm. when I've got really a document that it starts with just me owning it before I do anything with it it's not shared by default it's just for me to manage and if I want to start to bring people in in the early phase I can do that um, and it takes me and brings me all the content that I worked with so if you mm. sent me something I'd be able to see that in my shared with me view if I'm working on a, a group project where we get into that we space mm -hmm. I would see all of that content coming from the we space but because it's all the stuff that I have interactions with or people have added me to, OneDrive is really that view into everything that I'm working on, mm. mostly from a files perspective. I know that um, you're infinitely aware that people are still using OneDrive, uh, sorry, Outlook to share documents. And sure. So that first step of trying to help people understand the value of, instead of attaching that document, put it in somewhere like OneDrive. How, how do you help people on that journey? Um, I think the general question is, where should I really put this file from the get-go? Yeah. But you should also know it's not so rigid that you can't move it to the right next place. Mm -hmm. Because again, like the phases of life cycle of anything, may start with you and I working on it, yeah. but at some point it becomes the group's project. We've gotten greenlit, we're mm -hmm. ready to go. Our proposal was accepted. And then at some point, if it was a real broad campaign, we might graduate that to something that will communicate through an entire site not just the proposal document, that might have started it all. Mm. But uh, if I'm to own something, let's say it's a recurring presentation I give and I'm on the go and I make little tweaky changes, I'll have a version that I use to then present this particular presentation. Mm -hmm. But in what we call the document center, and this is a real case for Microsoft, we have presentations that anybody can come and pick up and deliver. Right. And it's got speaker notes and all that stuff. So that's been approved to be customer ready, it's got associated demos, even if you don't know how to do them. It's got mm -hmm. notes and kind of how-to guides. And you but can I'll, go there and find examples to get some inspiration. That's right. You can yeah. go and you can even watch videos that people have produced okay. to show you how to present this content. And that's sort of that outer loop where you might go and find the content. It's finished and it's for us. It's for everybody. Okay. But in the, in the me space, I'll keep a separate specific version for me because maybe I uh, know that I'm going to talk to this customer and they've got a little flavor of something special they want to hear about. So in my OneDrive, I might have a flavor of that document and I'll tweak it knowing that everybody else is going to go grab it. They might not be uh, using it as often as me. Mm. And that document will follow me wherever I go. Um, anytime I need to go to the document center, if it's somebody else's presentation, I can get the latest greatest. 
Um, our intent with everything, though, is know who needs to own it, know who mm. needs to then um, participate in it. And if it's something more like a knowledge management type scenario where mm. I've got a finished piece of content and I need to make sure that people know, is this customer ready, partner ready, internal only? Um, has it been approved by legal because maybe it's a big project that we're going to launch externally? Mm. Um, you know, and all the information that might be, for us, it's just more metadata or yeah. terms on a document. But back to your question, in OneDrive, I'm the owner. Mm. Um, but if I know from the get-go that I'm working with a number of vendors externally, that my entire team is going to be engaging on something like the SharePoint conference, for all of our session presentations, we wouldn't put that into one person's OneDrive. Oh, no. We would put that into a team site, which we, in fact, have and have started, and we call it the SharePoint conference 2019 team site. Um, and that has a chat component because we are connected to Microsoft Teams, and it has a planner aspect. We hear are Mark's tasks. Here are things that are going to get assigned to other people, mm. and of course, you know the full group's value. Um, and that's really that we space. When I start a new presentation or I give somebody the template, here's the template for all sessions at the SharePoint conference. I wouldn't put that in my OneDrive because my assumption is it's owned by the team, and they'll grab the template, create their new documents, and we'll ask them when you're done or you have a draft, mm. put it into the specific folder, which yeah. is a part of the team. So we think of that we space as it's shared already. So when you have something in your OneDrive you want to share with me, what do you have to do? Send me a link and an email. Mm -hmm. Not a hard thing to do and it's very practical. And you are still helping people understand the value of that and why. <laughs> sure. I mean, yeah. you know, the Exchange repository is not a terrible one but it's not necessarily one where you want to store your content not longer really term. Not really collaboration. And you know, I always like to walk people through what happens when you actually do a hard attachment on an email. So I've got it in my outbox, you've got it in your inbox, and then you forward it to somebody, and then maybe that's in their inbox, outbox, inbox, outbox, and all of a sudden we've got boxes everywhere and it's just crazy. You really mm. want to have a single source of truth. Yeah. And sending a link attachment or a smart attachment, if you want to think of it that way, retains the ownership, especially if I'm doing it for my OneDrive. I can share it with you, and at some point I can unshare it with you. Mm -hmm. I can share it with an external vendor, thank you very much for the paragraph that you added, and revoke that, you know, and I can even expire those links and mm. lock download and do a whole bunch of things. Mm. Again, that switch into the team, I can do all of that same files rich experience, but by default, if you and I are part of the same team and I put a document there, it's already shared with you. Exactly. I don't have to send you a link to an email to give you permissions. Mm. But we already know the boundaries of the permissions because we agreed to that when we created the team in the first place. And then that us space is, it's generally for the whole company, usually, mm -hmm. but only going to be one or two people that are going to go and update specific documents. And they're going to keep a record of this is the February version or this is the quarter, you know, Q2 version um, with the metadata that's now appropriate. Or hopefully at some point, they'll also be the ones that remove it from the repository because yeah. they know that it's no longer something that people uh, should come across in a mm. search or a discovery. So that if it's not in the repository or it's listed appropriately, then people should know, oh, I, I shouldn't ever find it. But if they do find it, they'll be aware of what's, what's its purpose supposed to be. Uh, if it's old and outdated, if it's not ready to share internal only. Again, back to that value. And so the me, we, us, there's, we think, distinct use cases of when you would use OneDrive or Teams or SharePoint. Uh, some of it goes way beyond files, which we can get into that conversation. I think it's a real easy one to then to think, yeah. well, what is Teams for versus SharePoint? Is mm. it one or the other? We always, of course, know that it's both. And we know that SharePoint doesn't do chat, and Teams isn't where you store really anything, except for the really nice hub experience of all your content. But that content is coming from lots of different places. Mm. And we've done a lot of work to make sure that SharePoint is a first party experience in Teams, and in Teams that you can then treat those assets as something that's easy to say, hey, Daryl, did you see the proposal? In fact, I'm just chatting with you right now, and you can within Teams, but more from a split screen Let's experience. Let's have a look at that together. Let's look at it right together. We can even co-author it because yeah. that's the value of storing something in SharePoint. But when you've got content in Teams, um, Teams wants you to keep it where the content is supposed to be. So if I'm looking at a Trello board, or if I'm working at a, a set of planner tasks, or I'm looking at a single document, or a whole repository of photography uh, that maybe you took because you do all these great 360 videos and photos, <laughs> I can go in there and it's just for me, if I'm a part of your team, you may set it up as a tab. Hey, I've got this great repository of videos that might be helpful when you're on your next training session. Mm. So I can turn to that. I could have in the past gone, thanks, Daryl, walked over to your URL that you sent me and go into that site, to the library or whatnot. 
But now it's just a tab in Teams, and you can say, you know, we've got all the photography. Whenever you need it, it's right there. Technically, it's stored in SharePoint, but for the end user, they just see it as a tab of photography assets that are available to me. Can I ask you about um, that, that scenario of you're trying to make the content discoverable and easy to find for a team member, and you want to work together. Yep. Um, how are you introducing customers into some of the core and basic concepts, and where would you build on that? I like to think of it as, as need to know knowledge. That from the offset, I need to know some basics around how to use Teams and where to put my files. Mm -hmm. But then there's good to know knowledge where I'm starting to add on to it some pro skills, um, which might not be pro in, in the pro sense, sure. but they are helping us uh, explore other collaboration possibilities. Well, you know, we talked a lot about files and we think it's fairly straightforward. I have a file that I need to put that other team members are going to get benefit from. So, of course, there's the files tab. And just for folks out there, you know, they're just asking, you know, the common file store is SharePoint, mm. but the entry point is through Teams, just your files in the files tab. But beyond files, the other area where we, we see a lot of people getting traction because it's a lot of different types of content is SharePoint news. So the uh, other thing that is like a, a pretty straightforward, you know, if you're using Teams, you've already tried the conversation. You started to dabble in files. But what happens when you actually start to bring rich content from outside? Well, you've only got rich text options in Teams. That's right. Sometimes you're going to want to bring in a video or maybe a gallery of pictures. There's yep. lots of options. There's a lot of options. And the one where we, we don't want to ding the Teams user interface because the course. intent of having a couple of tabs, having too many tabs in any channel or any team, it's just hard to know which channel is it in and, and whatnot. But mm. when you're in a channel, the value of how you lay things out there's a threshold, whatever that might be, five yeah. to ten tabs at most. But what you can accomplish with SharePoint News, or even just a standard SharePoint page, or on the extreme, even the full site, is you can build this rich canvas of contextual information. Mm. Again, back to your example, here's a 360 video that you did on how to use the To Do app. Yeah. Probably pretty straightforward, but you might have right next to it a paragraph that explains here is how to uh, add a picture to a to do task. Yeah. And then underneath that might be an explanation of what is to do, um, where to go download and install it, have that as a couple of quick links. You might have a couple screenshots as a gallery that you could thumb through. If you did all of that across four tabs, mm. your user's completely lost. I, I think um, if I can pivot a little to, to talking about how. SharePoint might be used to, to help uh, pass on knowledge. Mm -hmm. okay. The news pages are beautiful um, and what I hope to see is that we, as organizations we can allow people or at least upskill them to be able to create some, some great content yeah. in those news pages, share the news but also share what they know. Um, can, you, can you tell me a bit about how uh, there's a custom learning portal that's become that's right. uh, available <coughs> recently. Uh, how how um, that fits into um, SharePoint and, and um, you can construct content around that. So uh, out of the box, if you go and you go to what we call the PNP provisioning site, so a little mm -hmm. bit for IT out there for a moment, to go get the site, it's not an end user task. But once that site, which is called the Custom Learning Center for Office 365, it's as if you're taking a lot of rich how-to content and bringing it inside your tenant. So for one, you're not switching that context of leaving the tenant. Mm. You can also start to build out your own training paths. So if you want people to learn, again, more the out of box, here's what Teams does, here's what OneDrive does, here it has, has here's how to use Planner. Mm. You can do multiple plans for each team, you know, whatever the scenario might be. But then let's imagine either you provide them with new content, which isn't in the custom learning center by default, you can start to build out your own training paths based mm. on either how you're training them on the specific requirements they've asked you to build out content for, or forget Office 365 for a second, you've just built a new custom solution for how to track uh, you know, your, your uh, inventory mm. across uh, transportation. Or route. employee reviews or anything like that. Any number of things. Yeah. So you have a custom solution, whether it's built on technology or it's just process, you need to go here and submit this form and do whatever. You can build out that training asset, could just be a PDF, mm -hmm. or it could be a rich video, and build that into the custom learning center, truly mm -hmm. as now custom learning, and fit it in the right place. It may be that it is a solution that's oriented around SharePoint, think mm -hmm. in terms of a custom portal to do X and Y, or it could be something that was just a, here's a tab in Teams that we've created, because we had a nice widget that we built for SharePoint, now it's a tab in Teams, and here's the couple of steps on how you can add it to your yeah. team. So that might be custom yeah. learning. I'll, but, I'll just say there too, like the, the attraction I have to uh, something like the custom learning portal mm -hmm. is it's great that the content is available and it's already ready made from Microsoft support and yep. your support for Office. 
Um, but it is the context that we wrap around it that makes it relevant to people. That's where we fit in for our customers, is yep. to try and talk to them about how they work. And that's where you can use a SharePoint page to tell a little story around, this is how Bob does this over in HR, and um, how uh, he uses this tool and that tool in the context of his work. Yeah, it, it's a great platform for people to be able to share their own learning and uh, you know, in ideas and insights, which again sort of bleeds the the us space, you know, mm. the knowledge sharing. Um, here's a question, here's the definitive answer. Here's a problem that somebody hit, here's a video that is providing the solution. And once you've got some nuggets of the good stuff that you really want to up level so that it's easier to find, or as people start to attach some of these us spaces inside the we space, you know, so if you find the custom learning center, something that you want to go to, mm-hmm. well, you can also bring it as, as a tab in Teams. Or a web pod or a web part. So there's a lot of ways that you can bring in those assets. And I think the other thing that um, m- might be a little bit of a surprise, you know, in when we first launched it, but I think it's got a great use case and it really exemplifies for a user on how I can start to not just always have to be the one that's building the content to, to then have the value to share it. Mm. But if um, in the context of there's a Yammer discussion going on and you and I maybe are the team that manages making sure the questions get answered, But publicly, people are asking and engaging and doing a lot of things. There's a new Yammer web part for Teams. Right. Which usually make people go, whoa, i got to wrap around Daryl and say, what did he just say? (laughs) Did he just say Yammer inside of Teams? And the reality is, absolutely, Yammer is still the public asset. But when it's in context inside Teams, you and I can actually look at it have a private discussion. Hey, did you see that boiling up? People are really getting confused about our our recent delivery or whatever. Mm -hmm. And we have that private conversation, and we decide, you know what we should provide back to them? We'll do a little video, and we'll post it into the Yammer group. And again, without having to go out to Yammer and switch context around apps, it's just between two tabs. You and I are talking side by side with the Yammer conversation. We agree on what we're going to do. We do it, and then publicly post it into Yammer. Yeah, And I do it right there in that same user interface. Definitely. Now, the other place I see that's... uh going to be quite useful for for Yammer alongside content is the embedded Yammer web part, the new conversation web part, where you're you're creating content, but it's not enough to just have content there. People are going to be able to inject their opinions and their thoughts and have a discussion around it. Um, How do you see that playing out for organizations? So, you know, we originally started out with SharePoint a long time ago in the context of portals, Mm. and we've always had some notion of uh, conversation. We had the news feed. We had other assets. We acquired Gammer, and we really started to think of that as this is where you engage with your audience. So I can put together a beautiful portal and fill it all up with a bunch of information. But at the very bottom, if you have just a contact alias to send Mm -hmm. an email, that is not going to be engaging with your audience. So they're going to have questions. They're going to have concerns. They're going to have ideas. And it's like, hey, you know what I'd love to see here is blah, blah, blah. And, and if we're pla- if applying, sorry, if yep. providing that place um, at the time that that spark happens, right. they can drop it in there. That's right. How many times have you been somewhere and somebody says, uh, fill out this survey and grab this QR code? Or go to user voice. Uh, or go to user voice. Well, wait a minute. No, <laughs> it's still good to go to user voice. Okay. Uh, but no, you know, it's, it's the how much effort will the user actually go, even if they've got the most amazing idea and wonderful feedback. How far can we really expect them to go? in whatever situation and so make it easier make it engaging you know the things that both Yammer and Teams are getting better at is when I provide my feedback I can mention you I can like things I can even do something that might seem silly but I'll tell you it's very engaging to add visual components like emojis or you know the meme stuff where you can kind of type in your own text or even short videos I mean one of our customers uh, is a a well-known retail uh, furniture Uh business in Australia Um, and they are right into using videos for talking about how they've set up the store, is this the right product, yeah. or um, how is it going, and, and it's just so quick to do a video, and now being able to bring that in and alongside content and SharePoint oh, really yeah. quickly, well, that, creates a that conversation. Well, that definitely starts to paint the broader picture of when we really talk about a rich canvas, the SharePoint page, being able to put you know a document right next to a video, right next to a Gamber conversation, mm. and then wrap the context around some text to obviously put, paint a picture of why you put it all together, Kind of brings in that third element of stream. Yes. So stream obviously has one a of lot your of a lot of. It's absolutely one of my favorites. It started really as something that I was marketing yeah. um, as Office 365 video, and as it's grown up into stream, we see a lot of teams, and I mean that with a lowercase t, mm-hmm. leveraging it as a back end to accomplish a lot of things, big and small. Mm. And I think we've just started to talk about the big stuff. You might have heard of live events. 
<laughs> you <heard of> live <laughs> Have you done a live event yet? <clears throat> <laughs> or do you I'll, do them I'll every day? The and I just keep the expletives. Um, like, yes, no, I'll, I'll right in there, and yeah. we'll be in, introducing our customers and how to to get the most out of that from an employee engagement perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, it, you know, live events is 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 our epitome of how do you bring technology, not just for technology's sake, but to actually solve a problem. Mm. So not only does it scale very, you know, to a lot of users tuning in, seeing a great video experience, and being able to ask questions. But it also gives you a lot of ways to plan for the event as an individual. Gives you a lot of things for on demand and after the fact. Yeah. You can engage directly in Yammer. You can engage just on your mobile device because it's a you know simple um, for an attendee experience. You got a number of different roles where you could play all of them, like you probably do a producer, mm -hmm. a presenter, and an attendee. Yeah, yeah. And so we all do that. Or you can scale it up and do a multi-camera, you know, wonderful thing. But the other spectrum is what you were describing, and I, you know, I, I think where the team is going. Uh, you know, with building out this back end that can handle whatever you want with video, whatever mm -hmm. scale, whatever form factor somebody's consuming it on, and enable people to do those kind of finer tuned uh, presentations all the way back to I'm just going at my live desk, from my phone. I'm just doing my, my thing and I'm just going to share a little something with yeah. somebody. It's what, what you do after that is where my world kind of comes in. Is it really easy to link to that in an email? Of course. Um, as you start to embed that into a SharePoint site or a page or a news article, hey, did you see this presentation? If you've got any questions, you know, put it into the group mm. and have that all be wrapped into the same experience. So the live event has a great live experience. On demand, you might want to put together four or five of these things that equate to how to get trained That's or up right. to speed on new employee, uh, a higher type it, of It could be like this, that we're riffing, we're talking about how to do something and we record the whole thing, but we can take chunks of it and make it more consumable and easier to find. Yep. I think the other thing I like about it is that uh, for many videos, you just watch them and you kind of want to jump to the, the point that you want to um, find. You've yep. heard that there's some content in there and, and Stream, of course, is picking up and, and transcribing uh, the text that's in there, it's sure. finding the faces, making the content that's traditionally linear yep. easy to jump to and find. Yeah, and they're also even working on where you can inject things that you want to sort of pause the video. Yes, And say, hey, elements. fill out this form or check out this website. And when you're done, you close it and the video continues. And you know, a lot of that work was done in Office Mix, you know, a while back. <laughs> and it sounds like we got a stream fan over here yeah, yeah. cheering for stream. <laughs> yeah, that's and right. Uh, you know, so as you get to this interactive content, video is very engaging, but it's also that two-way street. You know, at some point, either it's going to be too long, you need to cut it up, mm. or you actually really want to get, hey, you just saw this, what did you think? As opposed to, you just watched all of this, and yeah. what do you think? Yeah. So um, I'm really excited when that comes out, because it'll give you a lot of different ways to slice and dice your, mm -hmm. your uh, content for the sake of that audience engagement. Yeah. And that's just within the video. Mm. Again, you can put the context of whatever you want around the video. Simple images and text, a Power BI dashboard, yeah. a Power app that's pulling in and giving somebody a place to visualize data. You know, there's endless possibilities of how you design the pages. You have to be mindful, certainly, on how people can consume them. But I think when you go from the me, the we, and the us, you're, you're really, um, as a content creator, really wanting to curate the experience. Mm. But at the same time, not have it be so static that people can't reach out to you can't um, benefit. One of the scenarios that we're really wanting to be mindful of is how do people reuse content. Mm. So if people have created a great news article, another person should be able to create it off of a template. Same with a document. We've had document templates forever. We all want a starting point. And I think uh, um, I'll just inject a little pause in there too yep. and saying like we recognize that um, people have little time. Their main focus is not the technology, it's the task that they're trying to achieve. And if we're wanting to try and pass on knowledge or enable them to create a news page or find a, a PowerPoint that inspires them and reuse some slides or whatever, it's all about trying to, to make that starting point a lot easier or pick up from where you left off. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can think of any time as may, maybe a simple scenario, but if I write a blog post, we may have a video, a GIF, or just a, tons of images. But there are so many other things that other teams have done. So mm. linking off to content or bringing it in, Again, in a blog, it's fairly straightforward, but internally when you're communicating, it's kind of like you've got little mini blogs everywhere. A tab could be a blog. It's just a way to convey information. Yeah. And the more context that you can add without contextual switching or uh, physical switching you know, from yeah. one place to the next, you'll hold the attention longer. And most likely you can deliver. Here's what you're looking for. I know, and you can change it any time. Mm. And that gets back to that 
the value of the single source of truth, especially yeah. when you're starting to aggregate content, is you're always seeing a fairly up-to-date view. If the video changes, if the PowerPoint changes, if the list data changes, if a task gets updated and moved. In real time, you'll see it the next time you visit the page. Mm. It's not just a intranet page that it goes way out of date and nobody's going to really come back to check in on it. Yeah. Now, um, there's one more thing before we wrap up, yeah. and, and it actually talks about switching. Sometimes we switch the way that we work and we go from desktop to device to, to browser. Yep. That experience of using SharePoint and related technologies like accessing your documents and um, reading a news page, yep. what's that experience like and uh, what advice would you give to uh, an organization that's trying to get people to start engaging more via the mobile apps? I, the biggest thing is you should think of Office 365 and all the different apps that people might come across, or the not so much the apps, the experiences, is they are designed to be mobile first. Right. So when we think of a SharePoint page, everything we were just talking about, this whole walk, is completely consumable and mobile. Videos, PowerPoint, app, uh, you know, PowerPoint documents, apps, whatever you put on the page, it will reflow and look beautiful on the mobile mm. app. The other thing is it's intended to reach the audience. So if we are publishing something as news, the value of news versus just keeping it as a SharePoint page means it'll actually flow out beyond the site itself. And it starts to get into the AI side of intelligence. So mm. you and I work closely together. I publish news. You'll probably see it. Yeah. Um, if somebody in my hierarchy chain publishes news, I'll probably see it. But if I'm also showing, showing interest in a topic or I visited a site, I'm not a member of it, but I've you know shown some interest there, I'll start to see assets. Suggested content. Suggested content right. that will flow to me, especially news. I'll see it in my news feed. And now we're starting to ship the authoritative news. So there will be the curation of what we want everybody to see. And then there's this bottoms up approach that says, well, Mark works with a lot of people and a lot mm. of content that he may or may not be interested in. But as the days go, that changes of who he works with and what he works on. And the news will feed off of that awareness and that intelligence. But not to divert too far from everybody in the company needs to hear what Satya just said. So yeah. I will see that banged at the top yep. um, amongst my aggregated news. And that's the same for aggregation of files, aggregation of sites, aggregation of um, tasks, whatever that might be where it's a roll-up of events, it's a roll-up of news, it's a roll-up of content. Because we know where the content is, we know who has the access to it, permissions. If I don't have permissions, I'll never see it. But if I have permissions and it seems to be of interest to you and maybe two or three other colleagues, mm. I'll start seeing it even if I don't go looking for it. Right. And there's value in to know, well, what's Daryl working on? Um, and again, forget about the content type because we're doing this intelligence and baking it in pretty yeah. much everywhere. But the easiest ones to visualize are documents of interest to me. Not the ones just that I own, but documents that are of interest to me. Same with news. And you know, there are ways, again, to curate across the internet to build out very specific experiences. But there's also a lot that we do that if you never take that curation path, we are showing you something that's relevant and personalized out of the gate. And on the mobile device, it's only that because mm. it knows who you are and, and are signed in and it knows what activity you've engaged in. Definitely. I know there's a lot more that we can talk about and I will call on you at some point. <laughs> I hope. Maybe we'll have the old side to side. Can you do you know, 3D from afar thing. if we're I wish. Teams, Wouldn't so. that be cool if yeah. you had one and I had one? Well, I'll could, just keep could... spinning around like this. And yeah. You'll get a, a 3D sense anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but thank you, Mark, for covering off the, um, these sorts of things for our customers because we all need a starting point. We know, we know that there's value in it from a technology sense, but we need to help our regular people who just day in, day out, they need to just get on with their work how can we enable them to achieve more? Yeah, and I would say, you know, obviously engage with Daryl and team when you kind of are at that stage of what does it do and what should we do? We know what we're trying to accomplish. And if you ever hit any break points where you think, oh, God, I'd love it if Microsoft did one thing or, or 10 things differently. Mm. You said user voice. That is a wonderful channel. We do pay attention to that. But also just make noise. Daryl, uh, we have conversation with him all the time. Yeah. And he feeds back like he's here this week at the MVP Summit. So it's a great place for him to provide feedback directly to us. Uh, but we're always listening, no matter where people are chatting, whether it's Twitter, whether it's the tech community, directly through you, user voices, and very feature-oriented. Um, we've got a lot of eyes and ears, and we always want to know what can we do better next time. Yeah, definitely. And that's, uh, you know, to, to point you also towards our Adoption Academy, that um, we have a community in there, and we're discussing 
how we might help your organisation to start using the benefits of SharePoint in the way that you work, OneDrive, and, and just really generally working with documents. You'll find some content in there about um, taking that journey. We have a roadmap, and you can check that out, and then you can engage with us in the forums. Thanks again, Mark. It's You're been welcome. great talking with you. Thank you. Nice chatting with you. Bye for now. Thanks.